Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the CEOs, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. This week, Lewis has back KCSA Vice President Gretchen Gailey to recap KCSA's inaugural Congressional Cannabis Day Forum. Our last show in this crucial series covers the Veterans and Medical Cannabis Panel. We were privileged to have with us a full panel of military veterans with Melissa Bryant, Chief Policy Officer for Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans Association, Joe Plensler, Director of Communications for the Wounded Warrior Project, Nick Eaton, Vice President of Government Affairs for Acreage Holdings, Bill Ferguson, Co-Founder of the Veterans Cannabis Coalition, and Moderator Michael Correa, Director of Government Relations for the National Cannabis Industry Association. Don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to our Congressional Cannabis Day Forum's Veterans and Medical Cannabis Panel. Gretchen, you are back. Can't I get you out of my office? Nope. I figure that's the best place if I want to get anything done. It's true. The best way to, to, to get me to focus on something is to keep it in front of my face. Yes. Um, speaking of in front of your face... Um, the, the last panel that we had at KCSA's DC Day um, was on veterans and their access to cannabis. And it is, you know, every one of these panels was important. The panel on, on the capital markets is important because if we can't get the financial services and the banking right, then the industry isn't going to grow and patients aren't going to have access you know, to the plant. If we don't deal with opioids and how how it can be used to, to, to wean people off, how the cannabis can be used to, to treat opioid addiction, then, you know, what's what the heck is the point of the medical side of it? And, and social justice is, is important, too. But, you know, as a country, we have been perpetually at war since World War II. We have always had men and women under arms in harm's way fighting on our behalf, suffering from issues of PTSD, of 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 lost limbs and pain and chronic injuries and not giving them access to cannabis has been doing, you know, the millions and millions of men and women who have served our country, um, you know, a major disservice. And for a number of these folks, uh, I mean, they tell stories of, you know, they try to use cannabis and then they get their, all of their uh, VA uh, rights taken away from them for trying to find some type of relief. Um, so it's it's hard to fathom that Americans who are probably, some could argue, making the greatest sacrifice for their country can't get the medical care that they're looking for or that they want. The ones, especially the ones who didn't get multiple deferments. <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> our moderator uh, was Michael Correa, uh, a good friend of ours. He's the re director of government relations for NCIA. And we did this during the NCIA lobby days and, and NCIA was very generous in giving us Michael to, to moderate this panel. Um, we also got to work with um, Melissa Bryant on the panel. She's the chief policy officer for Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, IAVA. They've been working a great deal trying to get access for a new generation of war fighters. Um, we also had Joe Plensler. He's the director of communications for Wounded Warrior Projects. Uh, and we also had Nick Eaton, who's the vice president of government affairs for Acreage Holdings. A client of KCSAs. They are. And they have also um, really kind of staked their claim trying to help veterans in the in cannabis community, which is great. Um, and then lastly, we have Bill Ferguson, uh, who's co-founder of the Veterans Cannabis Coalition, who's been fighting to get veterans access to cannabis for years now. So if you have any uh, family members who have served, if you yourself are a veteran, this really is the panel for you. Um, this is an important topic, and this was um, a really interesting conversation held by these people. Um, and as always, you know, if there are, are questions that you have or issues that you want us to raise— feel free to send us a note um, and drop us a line on um, uh, on any of these topics that were covered during KCSA's DC days or any other topics in general. Um, so now on to our veterans um, and medical cannabis conversation. Cannabis is a, a, an unbelievably complex issue. Um, and because we are here in DC, which is the locus of all things federal, 
Um, the issues around veterans' access to cannabis couldn't be more important, especially with now millions of, of Americans having served under, under arms uh, on our behalf. Um, and denying them access to this vital medicine has been something that is just patently absurd. Um, so that's what this panel is going to address. With that, Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Correa, and um, uh, Leah Heiss mentioned being so small, not wanting to speak at a podium. I'm so tall, I end up engulfing the podium, and so I'll sort of, I'll sort of just stand right over it before I eat it all. Uh, I'm Michael Correa, Director of Government Relations for the National Cannabis Industry Association, and uh, we've been lobbying on this issue for, this is my sixth year uh, working on the cannabis issue. We're having our lobby days this week, so we have 250 of our members on Capitol Hill this week doing events, and so it's great uh, doing events. It's, ca it's going to be cannabis, all, all cannabis all the time this week, so it's really amazing. And so we um, saw the social justice component, um, which was great, uh, just having that discussion, and now we wanted to talk about vets, and so I just wanted to go through, uh, introduce... Oh, wonderful. And so is he... Um, so, uh, well, one, we have a member of Congress coming in, and so uh, as a former staffer, staffer, you always step to the side. And so it's Ruben Gallego um, from Arizona. And I just want to say on a personal level, um, we, we had met the congressman before he was ever a congressman and before he was first running, and so we were one of the OGs to your campaign. And so I just want to say uh, you always come out to our events. Uh, it's always uh, wonderful. Um, hearing you speak. And so, uh, Congressman Ruben Gallego uh, from Arizona will say some few comments and we'll get back to the vets. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you to the panel for giving me this uh, opportunity. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me. And yes, I've been a longtime proponent both of medicinal marijuana for treatment of PTSD as well as uh, legalization of cannabis since my state house days, I think. Uh, which is, seems ancient to me now. Uh, and to, to, to have a sense of how the conversation has changed when I first introduced legalization in 2011 in Arizona, uh, my uh, political future was predicted to be, quote, dead. Uh, and uh, look uh, at what is actually going on in this country. We're certainly heading in the right direction. Uh, and thank you again for inviting me uh, for something that's really important, and it's my opinion that no Washington bureaucrat should ever interfere with a doctor's providing the best and most effective care to a wounded warriors after they return home. But that's what you see happening, and I am a veteran also of the Iraq War. Uh, I did belong to the VA uh, for a while once I returned uh, from the war, and uh, th there are a lot of things lacking there, but the one thing they could do better is give access and treatment as well as information regarding medical marijuana. It is now legal in 33 states, but even in states where it is legal, VA doctors are prohibited from recommending medical cannabis and the VA is prohibited from paying for medical cannabis from legal sources under state regulation. The FDA notes that there is considerable interest in the use of marijuana for a range of medical conditions, including TBI, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain all conditions that veterans experience at high rates, including me. And many veterans would ra much rather use medical cannabis than opioids. And I know many of my fellow uh, Marines that I served with have told me this, from different spectrums of life, from conservative uh, to rabid liberals, uh, those that have been especially dealing with PTSD have chosen, sometimes unfortunately illegally, to use cannabis rather than getting hooked on opioids that has had terrible, terrible repercussions throughout the veteran community. In fact, veterans are twice as likely as civilians to die from opioid overdose. The number of veterans with opioid use disorder has now tripled since 2003. It is no surprise that large number of veterans are demanding, including many members of Congress, the VA get out of the way so we can actually access safe medication that we need. It's an insult to our veterans that we trust them with weaponry, we trust them with life and death decisions within seconds, but yet we do not trust them to use medical cannabis in a manner that they deserve, that they want, and that it's safe. And I commit to you as a member of Congress and as a veteran of the Iraq War that I will continue also pushing for that right to happen. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, thank you to the panel for giving me this time. I greatly appreciate it.
Thank you, Congressman. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to go down the list, um, and we're just going to have everyone either give an opening or just an introduction about themselves, and we'll start going into questions. So first up is uh, Melissa Bryant with IAV, which is uh, Iraq, Afghanistan Veterans of America. Correct. Correct. And so let's start it out. All right. Uh, I'm the Chief Policy Officer for IAVA. I'm also an Army veteran myself, uh, served uh, for uh, just about to the halfway point uh, in my Army career before I had a crisis of conscience, went over to government to try to fix things there, worked in the Pentagon for a while, found out that was a bust, and then ended up over in advocacy where I think that we have much more effective pressure. And one of the things that IAVA has really been leading the, uh, the, the veteran community on has been Cannabis for Vets. We launched a campaign, massive campaign last year, in drawing attention to it, and we continue to work with uh, pretty much everyone sitting at the table today in ensuring that we're getting common sense solutions through to members of Congress. Um, this is something that for IAVA we've been looking at year over year from our member survey data, which is the largest survey of post-11 veterans that covers the gamut of issues, not uh, simply those that are germane to, uh, to vets. But in looking at Cannabis, 83% of IAVA members support legalizing medical cannabis. And of those, 90% of them want to see research on medical cannabis as an effective treatment for PTSD, chronic pain, and a host of other issues. Bottom line, it makes sense. We know that anecdotally our, our members are looking at this and possibly even using it. The sad thing is that only 31% out of our members that we surveyed last year uh, it said that they'd spoken with their VA clinician or provider about it, which means that that number is probably 100% in that they've used it and then not talked about it. And that's because of the stigmatization around cannabis. And so we want to demystify that. We want to see smart legislation like the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act passed among a dozen other bills that are now looking that, that Congress is now looking at in order to find the best possible solution so that we're not penalized for using something that we know can be an effective treatment. Uh, next up is Joe Plinsler with the Wounded Warrior Project. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm a 20-year combat veteran of the United States Marine Corps. I work for Wounded Warrior Project. We're the nation's largest direct service charity that's uh, tightly focused on veterans' mental health and physical health and wellness. Uh, we serve about 130,000 wounded, 130, wounded warriors um, injured and ill, and also about 32,000 family members and caregivers. Um, we also, in our constellation of care, have about 100 of the nation's most critically wounded Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And these are, as you might imagine, people who have survived grievous injuries, uh, mostly through IEDs on the battlefields. Um, we are for any evidence-based therapies that deliver superior health care outcomes for our nation's veterans. And so I brought some recent stats along with me today. A lot of what you'll hear me say confirms what you heard uh, Melissa say earlier. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Nick. Oh, that was quick. Uh, next up is Nick Etten with Acreage Holdings, and he used to be with the Wounded... Uh, Veterans the Cannabis Project. Veterans Cannabis yep. Project. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, my name is Nick Etten. Uh, my day job, I do work in the industry. I'm the head of government relations for Acreage Holdings, but prior to that, I was the founder of the Veterans Cannabis Project. The Veterans Cannabis Project was formed two years ago to advocate and lobby on behalf of veterans at the federal level for full legal access to cannabis. The organization itself, ultimately what our goal is, is to get cannabis into the VA and treated like any other treatment protocol uh, within, the, within the VA. I won't go back through, the, uh, through any of the stats as uh, Joe and Melissa did a great job talking about what some of those are, uh, but to say that what's really important for us is that uh, we can't necessarily wait uh, for what the research says. Well, we think the Veterans uh, Medical Cannabis Research Act is great. Veterans are dying, we talked a little bit earlier today, 22 a day uh, by suicide. We need solutions and we need them now. So uh, what we advocate for is full legal access immediately to cannabis as medicine for veterans. Thank you. Thank you. And last up, we have Bill Ferguson with the Veterans Cannabis Coalition. Hey, thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Bill Ferguson. I'm with the Veterans Cannabis Coalition. And uh, we give it out a lot of uh, cannabis to veterans for free and uh, discounted rates. Um, we fund hiking groups around the country that use cannabis as an uh, alternative to opioids and benzos. Um, I use it myself. I live in D.C., lived here like 12 years, and uh, so like in my free time, I, I try to advocate for reform also. But uh, we're more into, um, you know, direct services and uh, like particularly like bringing cannabis and exposing veterans to cannabis and educating them about cannabis and um, just really trying to build a community that's like proactive with it. And 
Yeah, so, but we do come here because we're in the neighborhood, and um, we we support everyone that's sitting at the table. So, yeah, that's what I got. Uh, one, thank you for that. And as I mentioned, I'm with the cannabis industry. I've worked with all these guys on some level, um, uh, which has been amazing. But I just wanted to hear each of you, like, um, that's not our main focus, but we're supportive of all the cause uh, you guys do. Legislation, you know, there's the Veterans Equal Access, you mentioned research. Uh, does the vets community coalesce behind one bill? Is there one bill? Are there multiple bills? What's the outcome you're looking for? If each of you could sort of talk about where your priority is and where your focus is. We as an industry care about the banking issue and the tax issue, which benefits everyone and eventually will benefit you guys. But what are you guys mostly focusing on? For IVA, we're focusing on the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act. That's the centerpiece of legislation that we've been championing because it seems to be at least the, the right equilibrium of those who at least want to you know, see anything that's verified through um, tested means, through FDA trials, et cetera, ensuring that we're not giving uh, our veterans access to any old swag, pretty much. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And so we want to make sure that they're being tested in the right way and that the trials that are going on right now, uh, particularly the one by Dr. Sue Sisley, is something that really pushes through and pushes the envelope to give that efficacy to many who are, excuse me, who are opposed to cannabis research. There are no less than, and in fact, I have a handy cheat sheet here. I'm not even going to go through all of them. There's over a dozen bills right now that are currently before a committee, and one of the things that the committee is working to do is to consolidate all this into a hearing and a separate discussion on cannabis. And I think that we're will end up as finding that happy medium for all so that everyone can be happy for, no matter where they sit on the yacht. So one thing before, Joe, you're saying there's all those bills out there or they've been introduced at one time and they're trying to coalesce and get... They've been... Uh, well, several bills have been introduced and the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act, which is bipartisan, made it out of committee last year, made it out of the House. It's the only one in terms of federal cannabis legislation that's made it out of committee. So that's progress. Unfortunately, we have to start all over with the 116th. So as of the 116th, I think there are... I don't know, maybe, Joe, you got the exact number off the top of your head. I think there are 14 bills that are floating out there right now to various degrees of whether you want to see it uh, decriminalized altogether, descheduled, or just seeing if VA will go ahead and do the research that we know they are authorized to do. Yeah, on that, our position is pretty simple. We just want the federal government to do the research and enable the research to be done. So, I mean, we've had you know a host of veterans come to us with the same stories that you've heard from, from other panelists about uh, how they're coping with with a lot of injuries, right? And um, and how they are seeking relief through cannabis. And I think, you know, these stories are compelling and they're they're especially meaningful. But until the clinical trials are done, it's really hard to come to the hill and uh, and press for meaningful um, uh, changes to legislation. So I think that that's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see the government enable or do. Uh, the research in the VA is is has a great tradition of doing outstanding research. I mean, they've invented the the nicotine patch, the pacemaker. They've done all sorts of amazing things that got the the um, one of the world's largest genomics projects going up at Jamaica Plain facility in uh, in Boston right now, uh, looking at precision medicine. So I think you know they are ideally positioned to take a look at the efficacy of this for uh, for our nation's veterans. Hey, before Nick, I had one question. So, a lot of times our opponents will use research as a way to slow play legalization. Well, if we just had the research, and they can wait 20 years or 30 years. Do, does that worry you? Do you think there'll be an outcome in any meaningful time where you can get something, or this could be slow played to where 20 years from now they're like still looking for the research? Just One thing that I've noticed is that a lot of bills are written that really don't consider the supply chain realities through NIDA and the FDA, where you know everything's being produced out of the University of Mississippi right now. And uh, you could talk to Dr. Sue Sisley and get a good gauge of how hard it was for her to do the nation's first triple blind study on PTSD and cannabis for veterans. And so, you know, I think, you know, when the legislations are written, it needs to also get ahead or get left of that to take a look at what is, you know, the current state of play with what's able to be produced for research purposes and address that as well. Because if you're looking at, you know, different, um, you know, different varieties of cannabis, different um, applications and things like that, different uh, uh, titrations in, in delivery, right, that facility needs to be able to produce those products to be tested. Or, you know, they need to bust up essentially a monopoly on, on cultivation for research purposes to enable that research to take place. And on, so, on that, you know, we had earlier discussion about strains and uh, effects and, you know, a lot of blue dreams or OGs or marketing terms versus whether you're going to uh, effectively uh, get a good uh, reaction. But 
Sue Cicely's mentioned this. She's actually said it's like dirt weed that's coming from the University of yeah. Mississippi. She usually and it's has really a... hard to get good research yeah. and actually have strains that are available that could well, actually benefit her. And beyond her. that, I mean, when I talked to Sue, I went out and actually visited her lab out in, um, in Scottsdale. And, you know, when she got the samples she was complaining about, when she actually found a, a Schedule One lab that was able to tell her what was in uh, uh, the cannabis that she received, she found mold, and they also found trace elements of lead. So, I mean, you know, she had a, a conversation that she relayed to me saying, you know, I, I was wondering if it was even ethical for me to administer this to my patients in this research protocol. Yeah, yeah I'd also add, I sat on a panel with Sue and, and been talking with her throughout this period of time uh, that we've been pushing legislation. And in addition to that, it's also the vehicle in which it's delivered. And so they're only testing on smokable. They're not testing on uh, vaping, they're not testing on edibles, and so there's ma many different ways in terms of what uh, Joe was just explaining that, uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of concerned that the data may be skewed and that may be something to fuel the flames of those, no pun intended, uh, for people who want to oppose uh, medical cannabis being used uh, by veterans, and there's a million different ways in which you could probably pick that apart, but unfortunately she's very much constrained by what are uh, the outlines of the FDA trials and to include the University of Mississippi that has this monopoly and has since the 60s on medical testing, or excuse me, um, FDA testing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Nick, you want to talk about legislation? Like I said, you, you have the corporate and at the same time the VED. Talk about that. Yeah, as far as legislation, um, I think that our organization, the Veterans Cannabis Project, we have the ability to go get a little bit more aggressive um, on legislation, and we uh, we absolutely support and want to see the Veterans Affairs Medical Cannabis Research Act passed, and we want to see good research moving forward through the VA, but ultimately the VA uh, acts at the direction of Congress and follows federal law. And so uh, we know that with the, the way that the system works inside the VA, that research is going to be slow and uh, it's, it's going to be methodical and slow. It's ultimately very valuable uh, at the end of the day, but it is a uh, process. So we, uh, we get a little bit more aggressive on our, uh, on our lobbying, and uh, we believe that the need, uh, look, the cannabis doesn't meet the litmus test of, of, of a Schedule One drug, and so we want to see it removed from that immediately. Whether, whether that's rescheduled or descheduled, uh, we, we advocate for, uh, for uh, uh, rescheduling or, or descheduling of the drug. The, um, uh, we also think that uh, the States Act is important, and it's important in that it, what it does is it, it protects those programs at the state level that are currently serving veterans. Now, they're serving veterans imperfectly because veterans are not able to rely on the VA uh, with respect to cannabis the way, the way they would for any other medication, but, uh, but we still want to see and sure, make sure that those state-level programs that do exist are um, that are, are not getting shut down and, and are not un interrupted as imperfect as they may be, so we we do get a little more, more aggressive on our our, uh, our lobbying. And Bill, what are you guys focusing on? Um, we we want to complete legalization. Um, we feel that like it's a waste of time at this point be, um, to to not really just go for the gusto. If you're going to work hard for something, work hard for the biggest goal. I think um, we're we're okay with all the other you know, bills that are out there pretty much, uh, because any progress is better than no progress. Um, when it comes to the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act, this is the third year we've been playing around with this thing. We were further along last year at this point than we are now. They pulled it from the hearing a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That ticked us all off. Um, it's an intellectually dishonest conversation we're having between the VA and um, the service organizations, because um, they can research it. John Hudak called them out on that uh, December of last year. And they're still continuing to say, well, we could do it, but it's, it's really hard to do it. There's bureaucratic hurdles. Well, I mean, combat's hard, you know? And, you, you know, the Congress and the taxpayers um, paid money to the VA, $200 billion a year, to, uh, to, to serve us, the end user. And so when you have us in large numbers and in mass, according to, like, IEVA study and everybody else, uh, you know, polling, like, why aren't you doing what we want? And so um, where we go from here is, is, you know, we think it's just a stalling tactic, you know, because, like, it's, they're delaying. I mean, the people are dying in the process. So the longer they deny the research, the more angry we become. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, hey, if states gets through first, we don't really care because, you know why, eventually we're getting some kind of protection because now we have yeah. guys losing retirements. We have people incarcerated. We have pensions getting taken away. We're getting labeled substance abuse disorder on our files. And it's a game to these people, and their lives are not games, and I'm, like, angry about it. And so the way I see it is, is, like, this is a do-nothing Congress. 
on this issue. So far, I mean, we're here we are five months in, you know, and we thought, hey, if we could just win the House or, hey, we could just hold this or do that, we would be somewhere. And so if whatever bill makes it this year, we want it to see it happen. We want all these bills to see the light of day. We want their fair shot. Um, but we're not getting it. And so um, who suffers from this? The end user, you know, the vets. So, I mean, then this is just our community's, I mean, our our organization's uh, view on it. Like, so all cannabis legislation that is, you know, moving is good legislation to me. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just we just got to do something because, you know, I mean, it's it's something weird. Like, you know, it's perfectly okay for you to take, like, a heavy narcotic and walk around like a zombie. But to use something natural, they're going to, like, strip you from your benefits that you went and earned, you know, and, like, disability payments, you know? Like, hey, I don't have an arm, but, you know, since you smoke weed, we're going to take that away from you, your little 500 bucks a month or whatever. Do you want to jump in, Joe? Yeah, please. Um, you know, I just wanted to kind of touch on that and talk about the transgenerational support for this issue in the veteran community, right? Um, at my previous job, I used to work over at the American Legion. They did a nationwide study of veteran households, not just their members, but just clearly across the country. This was done in the fall of 2017, and that, that survey found that 92% of veterans support medical cannabis research. 82% um, supported medical cannabis as a federally legal treatment option in their state. I mean, I, I don't know any other issue where you can get that level of, of agreement. Um, the other thing, too, is what we do every year, we conduct the nation's largest survey of wounded, injured, and ill veterans. I've got some early reports back in. We send this out to about 130,000 of our, our warriors every year. And 17% of our warriors indicated that they use cannabis to treat a mental or physical condition, and that 49% of these warriors know a veteran who is using cannabis. And these are early results, so they're not yet confirmed, but I just talked to our metrics folks before I came over today, and, and that's the numbers that they're telling me. So, you know, with the American Legion and VFW, both of them have, have uh, national resolutions uh, to advocate for research, um, you know, on their agendas. And these are organizations of more, more like Vietnam veteran era folks, and, and Melissa and I represent, you know, the generation of more, more of Iraq and Afghanistan. So, I mean, this is something that's connected across many decades of service. And it's important to know on, on Joe's point, for Iraq and Afghanistan, you're talking an entire statistical generation. So we have people yeah. who are retiring, and we have junior enlisted who are just starting their careers. And so, but we're, we're facing with 18 years of war, and therefore 18 years of wounds of war. And so, to Joe's point, and seeing across the entire generational spectrum, whether you're retired, Vietnam era, like my father is, but they also see it as, well, there's no impediment to me working. Um, and that's another angle of this that you're seeing maybe in some of the folks who were less willing to disclose their usage, especially for the younger generations. And that's because they do fear, to uh, Bill's point, being somehow penalized by the VA, even though the official stance of the VA is that you are able to talk to your provider. They cannot recommend. They cannot uh, speak to you about anything. They can say, sure, that's great. And they record the data, and that's essentially it. And to uh, Bill's point, he is correct in that this is under the purview of the Secretary of the VA. I'm going to save you a very long, boring story of how we got here, but this went back to the previous administration to where there was an interpretation of VA policy and what they could and could not do. And I'll just put it plainly in that many of the advocacy groups say, but this is within your purview. So you really don't need a bill for this, but it codifies it so that there's no question going forward. Um, and that's where I think a lot of us are now looking at it from a new nuanced perspective, and that is we want to make sure that people aren't self-medicating with something that could be bad or harmful for them. We want them to be educated on uh, use of cannabis and treating it for whatever your injuries may be, whether uh, physical or mental. And that's something that we also want to see come out of the research. The research should also be a guideline or a guidepost, rather, to what makes sense for you. Yeah. Um, uh, Michael, I just yeah, want to say one thing, even though, uh, which is important, even though we all take a little bit of a different uh, approach to uh, what's happening on the Hill, what I think is really important to note is that when I started the Veterans Cannabis Project two years ago, uh, I think, you know, Joe and I first met in the American Legion and come out with the resolution uh, or had, had done the, uh, the research study. And IAV, I believe, at that time had brought it onto its, its platform. Uh, but this is a sea change to have uh, two individuals from IAVA, Wounded Warrior Project, as well as uh, Bill and I from smaller organizations that are that's cannabis specific. Uh, the fact that the main large VSOs, including Paralyzed Veterans of America and Disabled Veterans of America, are taking a position on this issue is is a sea change for the veterans organizations, and so it's uh, it's uh, really we're making progress with uh, having such a diverse group of people up here today. Yeah, um, just a couple observations and thoughts. 
uh, uh, Congressman Matt Gates said this is no longer becoming a Republican Democratic issue. It's sort of a generational issue. And as Congress gets younger, it's just every Congress going forward is going to be getting better on this. Um, and I, I just want to question members of Congress. Um, how many members of Congress are former vets? And as that, um, I mean, are you guys targeting them? Do you go up and have a list? Hey, you're a former vet. What are you thinking? Is there, or is it just the usual perception of cannabis in general? Forget whether they're a vet or not. I, I will say this for the Veterans Cannabis Project. When we brought veterans uh, to the Hill, uh, we did, and we even we were contemplating starting a um, uh, 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 veterans caucus around uh, around cannabis uh, with members. Uh, we haven't gone quite that far yet, but um, I, I think that uh, if you look at, and I don't know what the percentage of, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what the percentage of uh, representatives that our uh, veterans is, are, excuse me, um, uh, but uh, I, I'd say about 90% of them, and that's uh, just off the top of my head, uh, are supporters, whether Democrats or Republicans, of uh, uh, introducing this idea or advancing the idea of cannabis for veterans for medicine? 13% is that number. 13% are veterans who are in uh, Congress right now. Of course, the fastest growing rate are the post and 11 generation who are coming in, especially what we uh, termed the camouflage, camouflage wave uh, last year uh, as they were all elected, but it's still far too less because, or far too few, I should say. Um, after uh, World War II, going into Vietnam, 77% of Congress were veterans. And so they understood the plight. Mm -hmm. They understood that we were a microcosm of society and that our, our attitudes and our positions often reflect where society is and usually before society gets there. So I liken it to the don't ask, don't tell uh, sea change that we witnessed. It was a matter of 10 years, 10 years when you went from don't ask, don't tell, to attitudes changing, to repeal of DOMA and repeal of uh, of our harmful policies. Now, one could argue we're kind of backsliding a little bit from there. That's a separate issue for another panel. But um, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. IAVA's opinions on everything. But I will say that um, in noticing the sea change and how far we've come, that is something that should be noted, and it is something that at least we're seeing bipartisan support within Congress, especially to at least do the bare minimum. I don't, I don't think I've spoken to anyone that we've talked to on the Hill that doesn't say research at least needs to be done. They just disagree on everything after that point. Yeah, yeah and I think one of the most compelling documents I've seen leading to this is uh, the National Academy of Science and Engineering and Medicine released a meta-analysis in January of 2017 where they took a look at 10,000 different studies around the world about the efficacy of cannabis. And three findings that they had was out of those 10,000 studies, they found conclusive or substantial evidence for efficacy in the treatment of chronic pain, the reduction of nausea in chemotherapy patients, and reducing spasticity in MS patients. And so, I mean, that's something that we're particularly interested in because, I mean, I, I don't think it's any far stretch of logic to understand a nexus between chronic pain, opioid abuse, and, and suicide, right? Uh, 20 veterans, we've heard, you know, minimum dying just about every day from, from these, uh, from death by suicide. And I, I think the other thing, too, is like most of the deaths that we're seeing now that it's not as kinetic in Iraq and Afghanistan right now, is through what we're terming toxic exposure and weird cancers in young veterans, uh, and clusters of weird cancers in young veterans. So I mean, I think you know, if you're talking about reduction of nausea and chemotherapy, you know, that's something that we'd also be interested in investigating as well. I think uh, Joe brings up a really interesting, uh, really important statistic, and that is 60% uh, uh, of what the VA treats in one form or another is chronic pain. And veterans have been hit by the opiate crisis at two times the rate the national average. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you've got a generation of, uh, of individuals who are leaving the service, who are retiring from the service, who are dealing with, uh, who, who are dealing with the after, after effects of that service, uh, which is generally, uh, a lot of it is chronic pain. And the VA for the past 15 years has been throwing opiates at, at, uh, at individuals. And so uh, it, it's uh, post-traumatic stress is important. Um, and so is traumatic brain injury. But when you're talking about 60% of what the VA treats in one form or another is chronic pain, you're talking about a solution that we need. Uh, you're talking about a problem that we need a, 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 a new and aggressive solution for. That's one thing that's always amazed me. Um, the VA won't think twice about addicting people or throwing any medication on demand on, on uh, the vets. Is there a conversation? I mean, do doctors even, I mean, from what I've heard is doctors are, you know, federal officials were afraid, don't even want to touch it. 
do you think that doctors and VA doctors want to have this discussion? Or is it like, I mean, from what have you been seeing through the VA um, to where they want to be supportive of the vets, they want to do it? I straight up won't tell them. I, I mean, I, I live in D.C. It's been legal here for five years. We've had some kind of uh, medical marijuana law since the early 90s. I won't tell my doctor because mm -hmm. I'm afraid they're going to take my compensation, write some kind of crap in my file like they do to my friends. And to me, it's like I'd rather just go home and deal with what I got to deal with. And, and, all, and their answers typically for me have been, here's a pill. We got a pill for that. Oh, take a pill for this to counteract the uh, side effects of that pill. Mm -hmm. And so me personally, it's like I want to make my own choices with my health care. And it's like this, I call it like uh, polypharmacy where they give you like these weird combinations of pills. And like you're on, I, I mean, if you talk to us, Nick, I think you call it the combat cocktail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so it's like you're on a sedative, you're on a, a, a mood stabilizer. You're on something to help you sleep, and then you're on something to like for your stomach that's messed up because you were taking all that and all this. And so for me, it's just much easier to use cannabis. I mean, it's a one-stop shop, and uh, you're, you're help, at least for me, it makes me feel better and uh, become a more productive member of society. So. Yeah, and, and Bill's, I mean, that's kind of what we hear from our members, too. Uh, we hear from our members a, a, across the, the spectrum, and a lot of them say, I won't even talk about it. I mean, we've, we've asked them on this, and again, 20% 20, 20 report using it for medicinal purposes. We only 31% uh, use those or her use report discussing it with their doctors. And again, I suspect that that number is 100% in that um, you'll get a different range of things. For one thing, when you talk to, um, since we're talking about opioids and pain management, you can also be labeled as a pill seeker by your uh, uh, provider at the VA. And so what they may do, um, and they don't necessarily call it that, but they'll say that you're seeking uh, excessive care from the VA, and it's essentially the code that they will input into your medical file, which will then say, we're not going to give you any sort of pain management, whether it's opioids, et cetera. Um, in fact, what they end up doing now is testing the Tylenol and saying, well, well maybe under some sort of placebo or, or rather not quite placebo, but quasi placebo and saying that, well, Tylenol will work for that pain management as well, as well. And there are studies that confirm that, but one size does not fit all. And that's what you want to be able to have is that nuanced conversation with your clinician. Mm -hmm. By policy, all your clinician can do is say, okay, and then record it. And then they put it into their treasure trove of information that groups like ours are constantly fighting for and submitting FOIAs for. Um, but that's essentially where it sits and at that point because they are not legally able to speak to you about recommendations or, um, or elsewise. I have, though, heard anecdotally from our members at IAVA that they have clinicians out there who have spoken to them. I, even if I knew their names, I'd never mention them because they're doing yeoman's work. But it wouldn't matter if they're in a legal state or not from that end? No. And no. Then, in fact, that's the center of other pieces of legislation to where uh, we want to see those. Uh, I think this is the Safe Harbor Act, which covers that. And that's if you're in one of the 33 states plus Puerto Rico and um, and, and Guam and the District of Columbia, where it has been legalized medicinally within that state, then you're then protected and able to speak with your provider about your use without fear of retribution. And I think some of the, the toughest conversations I've had with veterans is when they call and uh, you know you, you talk to them, before, especially ones who are living in states that don't have medical programs. Mm -hmm. and, and the story typically goes something like, you know, I'm, I'm basically assigned, you know, every drug that killed Anna Nicole Smith and I'm living like a zombie. Or I try smoking cannabis and I have better results, but I'm a criminal in my state. And so, you know, again, you know, these, these stories are, are help, heartfelt, they're heartbreaking, they're compelling, um, but, you know, we're not going to be able to change federal law, VA policy based on anecdote. We really do need clinical trials. We do need evidence to go forward. And, uh, you know, some of the other information that we came across that is particularly compelling, I mean, even on the DEA's own website, there's no known LD50 event related to cannabis. There's no known you know, deaths from cannabis overdose. So while we have, you know, Americans killing themselves, you know, 130 a day with Schedule II and Schedule III drugs, um, you know, that's an interesting statistic for us. And that's on the World Health Organization's website as well. Plus, um, you know, from our constellation of, of veterans who we care for, that 130,000, you know, 78% are reporting T uh, PTSD, 41% uh, have experienced a traumatic brain injury, 70% uh, are dealing with depression, uh, Sixty percent uh, deal with chronic pain, and uh, and so keep in mind that's not the veteran population writ large of twenty million veterans around the United States, but that is our our constellation of one hundred thirty thousand wounded, injured, and ill that we serve every day. Um, I've been doing this as I mentioned for six years, and when I started, it was sort of 
just being taken seriously, the giggle factor that, oh, uh, cannabis, ha, 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 this isn't serious. We're now serious. Um, the discussion is serious. The topic's serious. Uh, I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, where, where we, it, a lot of it is just educating, educating, educating. Um, and so Monday's Memorial Day, where we think about all those that served. Um, what are you guys from groups doing to educate Congress or educate the public? You're doing campaigns. What exactly are you guys doing to help what we are? Because maybe you have lobby firms, maybe not, maybe they're just on your own. I would love to hear what each of the groups are doing, because like I said, we support everything, um, everything you guys want, and we are trying to build coalitions, um, and we'd just love to hear what you guys are doing. I uh, I'll speak real quickly for the Veterans Cannabis Project. We have uh, underway a storytelling campaign. So we're gathering those stories and we'll be sharing those stories um, with uh, members of Congress, with uh, state legislators as well, with the public and with other veterans. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, facts are great, facts support, but stories sell and stories change opinions. And so uh, our organization is, is focused on storytelling. I'll say for IVA, we do a combination of both. We come with the data, and this is just our you know, 2019 member survey, I like guess snapshot. If you go to IAVA.org slash, sur uh, slash survey, you'll be able to see the full results of our uh, latest member survey and uh, where we talk specifically about attitudes towards cannabis and smoking writ large. Uh, because that's also something that uh, disproportionately impacts our community. Um, but beyond, we, we take the stories, we take the data that's from this, we take the data, everything that pretty much everyone at this panel has said, especially Joe with the World Health Organization, CDC, um, VA's own release data, we take all of that in a lit review and we aggregate that into our policy agenda positions. And in support of our policy agenda, we do quarterly uh, fly-in weeks where we bring in our members who talk about it. And one of the things, I'll be honest, in that we started out having difficulty with, but more and more we're getting more support, are veterans who are willing to speak on camera and tell those stories because they don't want to be labeled the pothead who then is, you know, advocating for this. There's still a little bit of that giggle factor and still a lot of that stigma that many feel and they don't want to spe necessarily speak on camera. But when we asked on our Facebook page of our members, you know, just curious, how many of you have faced challenges or feel as though there's a barrier to you discussing this with the VA? hundreds then flooded in and responses came in and saying either I won't speak on this or I will and hear the following reasons for why or why not. And so we know that that melding of the data and the storytelling is absolutely something that we need to do to keep the pressure up. And again, I say if you feel like we're, we're being set back, think of it in terms of movement, social movements. And the last major social movement we had in this country was on gay rights and gay marriage. And that was essentially a 10-year movement that took shape along those lines. And so if you think of it that way, since you've been doing it for six years, yeah. we're getting close to the other half of that. Um, the hope would be, and I'm going to correct myself here in terms of statistics, there are 25 bills in the 116th so far. Oh. 25 so far. And that's part of why they canceled that hearing. Like, it, yeah, it sucked, but by the same token, they canceled the hearing because they realized there's so many opinions yeah. that are out there right now. So 25 in the 116th, there were over 60 in the 115th. So we're getting there because if you consider that's the two-year cycle, we're in the first five months of this uh, congressional session, and we're already at nearly double or uh, nearly half of that number. Before Joe jumps in, I just want to say on that, we had a strategy meeting with members of Congress years ago, and they asked uh, uh, what they wanted from us, and we in the advocacy community had said fewer bills because we wanted to coalesce around fewer bills. They're members of Congress. They have egos. They want their own bill. And so instead of coalescing around a VETS bill or two VETS bill or three, you start going and it divides the co-sponsors. And you're like, which VETS bill do I get behind? And so that's something we're working on. But Joe would love to hear what your group's doing, how you're educating no, members. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, what's important to remember is that, that the fix, we're in the right house for the fix, mm -hmm. right? I mean, to get the legislation passed, to enable the research, to, to get to scientific conclusions on the efficacy. Um, and, you know, when I pull the thread on that, and you look at how that process gets done. I mean, if you look at the executive branch, if, if it were to start there, I mean, it literally is a Rube Goldberg contraption where, you know, like the, the domino falls and hits the marble that rules. I mean, it's, it's incredibly complicated with multiple agencies. We're over here. It's just like, you know, you get 535 people to agree, and they direct the executive branch to do it, mm -hmm. just to do the research, right? Um, so I, I think that's important. I mean, even, you know, just... Was it last week? The head of uh, VA's national director of suicide prevention, 
you know, said the department supports medical marijuana research, right? Currently involved in, in a trial for treating PTSD. And the secretary was on the record for saying that he would explore medical cannabis for veterans, but only if the federal law changes first. It's right. a chicken and egg argument. It's, they always go, well, yep. we need to change the law, but we're not going to change the law until we get enough people supporting it, enough exactly. people who support it. It's just one of those things with Bill. Love to hear what you guys Yeah, so after the bills were pulled the other day, so we, we set up a thing for this weekend. Uh, you can text VCC to, what is it, uh, 52886, and that will, like, link you with your uh, member of Congress if you support uh, cannabis for, uh, met, you know, for veterans and um, for particularly that piece of legislation. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's a delay tactic. I mean, we've had this discussion going on for years. We've worked with staff for years on this issue. And I mean, at the last second, when it's going in an omnibus and a must-pass spending bill, you're gonna snatch it out. I mean, yeah, there's differing opinions. There's been differing opinions the whole time. I mean, we got out of the committee last year and blocked in rules. We had 27 edits from that point on to move forward. So at this point, it's, it's on the VA secretary because the VA secretary can do this at any given point in time. And so, I mean, why aren't we standing outside the VA right now saying, do the work? You know, so, um, you know, I just think that, you know, we've passed this point of being nice because we've been nice this long, you know, and it's time to make a little bit of noise. And so that's the difference between, I guess, my organization and the others. But, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of, uh, we're, we're giving away some cannabis this weekend and we're going to have uh, events going on in um, California, Massachusetts, Florida and a couple other places. And uh, so we're all looking forward to it. There's two days that are kind of sacred to former service members, and that's Veterans Day and Memorial Day. And so just uh, while you're getting your discounted furniture or whatever, we're cool with that. Um, <laughs> just remember why you're getting it, you know? And uh, there's a lot of people, 80,000 never made it back. So uh, happy Memorial Day to everybody. And it was really cool for you to like let me come here. And so uh, I'll yeah, stop talking. And then um, I, everyone, if anyone has some questions, start working their way up to the microphone. We'll let <laughs> um, people ask questions. But I just wanted to say, you know, on the issue, you know, I, I tell people the polling, you know, um, there's so, sort of a spectrum and you have you have hemp, you have CBD, you have vets, you have medical and you have adult use mm -hmm. of where politicians are. Um, and and our issue, the banking issue has had a hearing. It's had a markup. It's moved. It's probably going to be voted on. I tell people it's the least marijuana marijuana bill because it's a banking bill. And so. I think, you know, selfishly, I, I want us to succeed. If we succeed, everyone benefits from that. But I do think politically, the next thing is um, everyone loves their vets. And how can you serve your country and then not be able to have access to medicine? So I see, I see the vets issue as like the next issue because, I mean, I hate to say it. I don't want to say you're an asshole, but you're an asshole if you don't support vets <laughs> on something like this. They serve their country. And now all they're looking for is medicine. So I think something like that politically, they're going to be able to come around. And I look at it as low-hanging fruit. And what's the next thing? And we, right. we all want more research. We all want yeah. more Veterans research. health is a bipartisan yeah. issue. Yeah. And it, and it yeah. should remain that way. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Here's the correct. challenge, though, is that for every politician with their ego, they always politicize things, right? Mm -hmm. So for us personally, for Memorial Day, we actually have a campaign that says go silent. And it's remember what it's for. And that is, uh, you know, it's the one time IAVA will tell you to be quiet. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, you know, enjoy your barbecues and your Applebee's discount, but also remember those who are fallen. And one of the things that we're consistent with in our messaging and our education piece to others is that remember also when we honor the fallen, and we usually go through Section 60 on Memorial Day after we do a, a wreath playing ceremony um, at Arlington National Cemetery, we also say remember those who died from related wounds, and that includes the uh, invisible wounds of war. That includes those who died by suicide. And so all of this is inextricably linked. Linked. And you're absolutely right in looking at all the solutions that get to this because we have a major problem that's of suicide, which is also an American public health crisis. Again, we're a microcosm of a lot of things. And so a lot of politicians do glom onto that and say, well, if you're not for your troops, what are you for? Yeah. But there's an element of jingoism sometimes that comes into that. And there's also an element of politicization of vets and using us as pawns and props to, you know, in order to move the needle on things. And the reason why banking has moved forward and CBD, in fact, with the farm bill is because money. And so that's the one thing at least people can understand is that, well, there's, there's commerce involved here. And if that's what gets you on board, then hey, great. But, you know, really in speaking altruistically in terms of supporting the troops, it should be hearing from us. Mm -hmm. And there's enough polling out there from all the organizations, enough reputable data to go from to say, just do the damn research already and let's move the conversation. Yeah, as we're leading it into Memorial Day, I think it's a good time just to remember that since 9-11 alone, there's been nearly 7,000 people who have been killed in action from the U.S. military. There's been 53,000 who are wearing the Purple Heart Medal for being wounded in combat. 
And that just begins to scratch the surface. So you could, sh you could fill Chicago's soldier field with, with the number of killed in action and wounded in action. Now multiply those stadiums times two for the parents, another stadium and a half for all the brothers and sisters who've lost a loved one or have been impacted by the war. Um, and beyond that, with the invisible wounds of war, I mean, our Department of Defense has recorded three, over 380,000 traumatic brain injuries, uh, both in combat and in training since 2000. So, I mean, there's a lot of Americans out there who are living with, with the impact of not only combat, but, but the preparations for. That's great. And then if we don't have questions, uh, uh, yeah, come on up. Hi, I just want to say thank you, first of all, because there's some of us that, you know, are scared but we say thank you for doing it for us, so thank you. Um, in D.C., we've done uh, a few things. We've done um, a VA hospital takeover. We went to Veteran Affairs Hospital in D.C., and we provided free marijuana, free edibles. Um, they kicked us out the hospital. They threatened to arrest us. They did a lot. Um, we also went down to the White House, and we emptied over um, 5,000 empty pill bottles. Um, but we want to know what else can we do? We, we legislate and we lobby. We, we become community lobbyists, you know, to support veterans as well as the ones that have been impacted by the war on drugs. But how can we help more? Like, what do you suggest that we do to back you all? Well, I would say first, the easiest thing you can do um, for most of us, there is uh, a take action button on our websites. And I know for IAVAs, ours goes towards the pieces of legislation that I discussed that we support. And that's just the easiest thing to do. Click the button, send it to your representatives. Secondly, um, you know, we're, we're limited in what we can do. And, and you've gathered that from the spectrum. I think we kind of go exactly down the line of what we can do as service organizations who routinely work with the, uh, the secretary of the VA, secretary of DOD, and in trying to push for, forward smart policy, because it's not all legislation, sometimes it's just administrative policy. And so because of that, we're in sometimes a precarious relationship to where we receive that feedback but can't necessarily do anything with it. So keep the activists, you know, ways up. Um, I'm not going to say go get arrested, <laughs> um, but, you know, the empty pill bottle activation, things like that, those are things that do gather attention, garner attention rather, and... Um, at least from our perspective, keeping the pressure up on the conversation is what's necessary. And um, we have two more questions, but the quick response, being a political guy, it's amazing what like 100 strategic phone calls would do to a congressional office. And so uh, at the local area, the local area going to the district offices and bringing people there and just hearing from them. So when DC hears, oh man, we got 50 calls from the, the, the district office, that makes a difference, getting them to co-sponsor something and just being politically politically engaged because members of Congress, if they don't have to deal with an issue, they won't deal with an issue and they'll just put it away. So it's just being heard and know why it's uh, important. Michael, just uh, one comment on the uh, uh, on the activism. Um, while it does garner a lot of press and it does get uh, clicks and it, it, it brings an issue to the forefront, uh, a lot of times what happens is uh, when, when lawmakers see a veteran uh, that might uh, take a, a sort of an activist route, uh, towards a problem where they're demonstrating in front of a building. Uh, what that legislator does is it then says as well, it, it gives them the, the ability to, or uh, it gives them the ability to say, well, that's a disgruntled veteran. And they marginalize that individual's message. Sometimes the most effective way to, to, to get your message heard is uh, whether it's your style, whether it's an individual style or not, is to put on a suit and a tie and go in and have a conversation directly with the representative. Um, it's very difficult for them to say uh, to say no uh, to somebody in that type of a setting. So, um, all all different types of uh, of of, of uh, activism, I, I think, is uh, is uniquely successful. But uh, in certain settings, there are there are some forms of conversation that. Uh, uh, are more uh, that are that are just more successful if they're done one on one. I want to thank you all for your your um, advocacy of veterans. I, I don't have so much of a as a question as a, an observation, and I believe that um, from what I understand, the opioid crisis was actually brought on by the FDA's lack of oversight or lack of research on the long-term impact of, of opioid use. So this isn't so much a danger issue as much as it is a money issue. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, it may the advocacy or the, the, the veterans' rights to use marijuana may have to wait until the 
financial balance tilts to the point where they're going to make as much money off of marijuana as they are on big pharma. Um, I hope that's not the case, and it could be that at the pace that marijuana is growing, it, it, it could happen in two years, three years. But it's just too high of a cost, and I just encourage you all to keep doing what you're doing because they need it. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say on that note, I want to thank our panelists and thank the audience because I know you guys have an agenda to keep, and so we'll go on to the next one. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to our panel on veterans and cannabis. It really makes a difference for people like us and people like you to pay attention to these issues. Um, if you want, you can follow us on social media. Um, on Twitter, our handle is at the underscore Green Rush. On Instagram, the handle is at the Green Rush underscore podcast. You can send us email at KCSA at Green... No, I'm sorry, that's backwards. It's <laughs> it's the Green Rush at KCSA.com. Um, and please, subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcatcher. That's one take, Shay. One take. Get